Good. Okay. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay. I think I will use this. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. There you go. Amen. It's always good to be in the house of God. Amen. Amen. It's always, always, always for me. When I come to church, I get fired up because I don't do this every day. Uh, we go through all the week. I mean, we go through the week doing our regular job, but this is the day of the God. I mean, this is the day of God. Amen. So when we come to church, we come with all our hearts, clear of all our distraction, and just to give God glory. Amen. Okay. Let me give you a quick scenario. What if, instead of me preaching to you, took the Bible, put the Bible on the pew, and go and sit down, and the Bible begin to preach to you in the name of Jesus? What would be your reaction? Most of you are going to go home believing that, wow, God spoke to me today. Because... The word of God came from a different source that you used to. But the truth is, it happened Sabbath after Sabbath. When somebody stands here and brings the word of God, it's coming from God. Yeah. But we react differently because we are familiar with the source. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, every time somebody brings the word of God, our reaction should be the same. It is the word of God. So today, I'm going to talk to you on the topic, the danger of playing church. From the picture, you see the little girl playing with her little house. It is cute. It's nice. But when Christians play church, it is dangerous. Not just to yourself, but to God and to the people around you, because it is Pretense. It is deceiving. My message today is about the danger of playing church, exhibiting fake spirituality and hypocrisy. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But he was constantly surrounded by lies and hypocrisy. Today, we have the same problem in our church, in our churches. We are constantly surrounded by fake Spirituality and hypocrisy. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God in heaven, Lord, we know that we are not here by accident. We know that you brought us here today, O oh Lord, because you want for us to hear this message, Father. Please, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, touch my tongue, that whatsoever I say, O oh God, will be acceptable in the sight. And I pray you bless every heart here today, O oh God. May the Spirit of God convict us today, Father, that what we hear will have an impact on our lives and all those that are around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let me just read, read the uh, first few texts. It says, early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing the fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but for nothing except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. Now, let me give you a quick uh, information about a fig tree. Fig tree can grow can get up to 20 feet high and 20 feet wide. They are great tree for shade. Now, fig tree bear fruit twice a year, May and June, and later in the year. But the important thing about fig tree is that when you see leaves on the fig tree, it means it already has fruit because the fruit comes before the leaves. Did you catch that? The fruit comes before the leaves. And here's the important point. Okay, but what do we see? 
According to the scripture, Jesus came by the fig tree. What did he find? Leaves. There was no fruit. And what did he do? He said uh, in, in verse 19, let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. In other words, he cursed the tree. He pronounced destruction of the tree. He killed the tree with his word. And presently, the fig tree withered. The second day, when the disciple came back, they saw the tree dead. It was not dying. It was dead. And it became for Jesus an opportunity for a profound illustration. You see, Jesus is the master of capturing illustration of, out of nature. He uses water, birds, animals, wine skin, flowers. He uses anything to teach us spiritual lesson that will last from generation to generation. And he did it yet. Now, what the illustration about the fig tree? It is obvious. The tree has a pretense of fruit, but no fruit. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel. The leaves are symbolic of Israel religious activities and their fruitlessness. They have a form of godliness without power. This cousin of the fig tree represents the state of hypocrisy in general. This teaches us that Christ looks for the power of religion in those who profess it. Did you catch that? Christ looks for the power of religion in those who profess it. If you profess to be a Christian, Christ looks for the power of the gospel in you. Amen? He looks at the heart. He doesn't look like men look. Men look on the outside, but God looks on the inside. Amen? So if you profess to have religion, God looks to see the power of religion in you. The fig tree that had no fruit soon lost its leaves. Paul says in Romans 10.2, they have a zeal for God without knowledge. Also, you see, fruit is the indication of salvation in the Bible. Let's see in Matthew chapter 7, it says, in the summer on the mount, our Lord says, by their fruit you shall know them. By their fruit you shall know them. And also, in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the full soil. And you find the good soil, and the good soil is seen to be good because it produces fruits, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. And he didn't stop there. Also in John 15, verse 5, and it says, Every branch that abides in me bring forth fruit. Fruit is ever and always a manifestation of true salvation. And what God is saying here is Israel is a nation with pretense of religion that is unsaved, unredeemed, lost, cut off from God. Jerusalem and Judaism are spiritually fruitless, sinful, and cause for judgment. The children of Israel forgot what John the Baptist said. This is what John the Baptist said. He said, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge the flow and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. That's Matthew 3, 12. Jesus will come again to judge this world. Brothers and sisters, the same Jesus that walked the earth 2,000 years ago is, is going to come again in judgment. The question is, what type of people is he going to find in the Okinawa International Church? The bridegroom is coming for his bride, the church. We will be like the priests and Pharisees, or we will be different. This message of the fig tree also serves as a warning to those who warning to us to be authentic 
in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? It also serves as a warning to us to be authentic in our relationship with Jesus Christ. God is looking for people who are totally committed to him and bear fruit of love and true spirituality. Amen. Nothing was as it seemed. Nothing was as it seemed. The priests and the Pharisees, who were supposed to be leading the people towards God, they did everything in their power to discourage the people from following Jesus Christ. Jesus continued to challenge them for their pretense and false religion. He was very vocal. He was very confrontational when he dealt with the Pharisees for hypocrisy. For centuries, they sang, they prayed, they looked for their coming king. And when the Son of God came, they rejected him. Nothing was as it seemed. Let's look at two points today. Today I would like to talk on two points that are helpful if we are going to be true Christians or disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many ways you could go with this sermon, but I'm going to just focus on two points. The first one is religious hypocrisy. Religion hypocrisy. Billions of religion but not a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus did. He states, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are so far away from me. Did you catch that? They draw near to me with their lips and their heart, but their, I mean, their lips and their mouth but their hearts are far away from me. Also, a quote from a... Get it right. Also, a quote from a A.W. Tozel says, millions of professed believers talk as if Christ were real and act as if he was not. They act... They always do things that contradict their speech. Religion people often say good things, but their hearts deliberately disobey God. This is called religion hypocrisy. God dislikes it. A professed spiritual person acts spiritually, but doesn't know God. Jesus was very confrontational, as I said earlier. In Matthew, I think I went ahead of my slide. In Matthew 12, 33, 34, it reads, For a tree is known by its fruit, broad or viper. How can you be evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, how is this relevant to us today? How? We saw what he did to the fig tree. God wants for us to keep our relationship with him authentic and real. What does Jesus see when he inspects the tree of our life? What does he see when he inspects the tree of our church? Does he see leaves or he see fruit? What does Jesus see when he inspects the tree of our families, of our own faith? Does he find fruit? Or leaves? Is he going to find belief or faithfulness in our homes, at our jobs, in our businesses? Is he going to find belief or faithfulness in our relationship with our spouse, in our relationship with our church members? What is he going to find in our lives? Fruit or just leaves? Is he going to find our life characterized by the things that we do? Because we trust Christ? Or is he going to find empty leaves of self-love self and self-absorption? What is he going to find today? Does our faith in Christ touch those around us? When Jesus searches our church, our hearts, and our homes, he's looking for faithfulness and fruitfulness. Maybe we need to ask ourselves a question. Are we really just producing leaves? 
or are we producing fruits? For many, for many of us, church has become a formality. We go to church sporadically, and if we do, but we rather stay at home and do nothing. And when we come to church, we get so disengaged. The things of church become so boring and dull. It's impossible to spend all week doing what you want to do and come to church and get connected with the things of God. It's impossible. Many of us expect to be changed by a single sermon. It is possible, but I'll tell you what. If you come to church and you don't feel or you don't enjoy the sermon or the singing, it's not the church fault. Amen. Amen. But sometimes we leave the church because the singing was not hot. It's not a temperature. You don't have to feel it. So if you come to church and you get disconnected because of the preaching or because of the pastor or you don't like the people around you, you need to ask the question, is it them or me? So it is a dangerous thing to be, to be disengaged with God. It is nobody's fault but your fault. From Monday to Friday, you have to be in tune with God, and then when you come to church, it will make sense. It will make sense. For many of us, our social media posts resemble Hollywood and not the work of the Spirit. We choose our friends that complement our worldly lifestyle rather than friends that will challenge us to live for God. They look forward to consuming alcohol and avoid prayer and Bible studies. The things of the world excite them, but the things of God make them bold or embarrassed. Sometimes our movie choices resemble those of society. Our conversation sometimes, and again, I'm talking to myself. I'm not pointing a finger. This, we are all human beings. And when I prepare a sermon, I try to speak to me, and hopefully it will spill over to you. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Their conversation at work, every topic, include every topic except God. Sometimes we get embarrassed to talk about God. At home, our walls are shadow, and our lifestyle does not resemble things of God. Our thoughts, our thoughts and our focus are on prosperity, pleasure, or entertainment. We are busy playing church. We come to church and we do what we have to do. We pretend. We do nothing in church move or spiritually. Because we continue to play church. We continue to play church. This is why it's important that we pray that God would send his Holy Spirit. That God would revive our church. God will revive our hearts. And he will point us to praying to him. Because we need to pray. We need to pray not just when we come to church. We need to pray daily. That's one reason why I enjoy the prayer warrior section. Because it gives me time to spend time with the Lord and with my fellow yes. prayer warrior. Yes. Church, I will urge you to please pray for the prayer warrior. It's very important. Because what we do, we intercede for the church and for family members. The devil doesn't like that. So please join us. Let us continue to pray that our life will be in tune with God. Amen? It is time for us to truly pray and ask God for awakening in our nation and awakening in our church and in our homes. Matthew 7 says, beginning 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many 
will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? Or preached in that name? Or in that name have cast out demons? And in that name done many wonderful works? And then I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquities. Are we busy playing church? The second point I would like to uh, emphasize on is love. We, as human beings, it's not natural for us to love. The Bible says God is love. You were not born with love. You have to pray for God to give you love. Our nature does not love naturally. God is love. Love is one of the most difficult things for Christians to practice. The Bible says God is love. In other words, you must have Jesus in your heart to have love. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, but this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one and another. Right. Amen. Did the disciples have love for one another? Let's see what the Bible says about that. Acts 2, 44, 47. All the believers were gathered and had everything in common. They sold properties and possessions to give to one another who were in need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Amen? The disciples have loved. Do you love your brothers and sisters? Look around you. We were all made in the image of God. We were all made in the image of God. That means, and I will say this slowly, that means the closest you will come to seeing God in this body is by seeing another human being. Amen? Amen. The closest you will come to seeing God is by seeing another person. The devil has succeeded in making us to believe that we are so different. Instead of us loving our brothers and caring for one another, we focus on features. He's different from me. He's tall. He's black. He's white. He's fat. He's skinny. We focus on features and we don't focus on the one thing we're supposed to focus on. We are all made in the image of God. We pretend to love. We come to church and we play church. John, inspired by the uh, Holy Spirit, wrote, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We Seventh-day Adventists, we know our Bible. We can quote the scripture for you all day. And we come to church regularly. The question is, do we love one another? Do we love our church or is it all pretense? Sometimes we have to catch ourselves, ourselves, because you see somebody in the church and you wish to shake the hand, hi, how are you? And then you're moving forward to the next person. You don't really mean that. Do you really care for your brethren in the church? Are you really concerned about them? That's love. That's love. We have to genuinely... Now, love hurts. Remember, love does not come naturally. So it's not our natural state of being to love. Love hurts. You have to be intentional to love somebody, to care about somebody. You got to be... You got to think about it. But to not care... It comes naturally. You don't have to think about not caring. That's what we do naturally. We don't care. It's not my business. 
But to love and to care, you have to think about it. You got to pray for God to give you patience, for God to make you care. Amen? Amen. Jesus knows the difference between hypocritical love and Christian love. True Christian love does not gossip. True Christian love does not lie. True Christian love does not fake a smile. And we'll see that in the church. Are we busy playing church? Or we are authentic in our Christian life? True Christian love does not hate his or her brothers or sisters. 1 John 4.20 says, If a man say he loves God, but hates his, but hates his brother, he is a liar. He is a pretender. I, I, I just put that there. And he also a hypocrite. He has leaves, but no fruit. Our society has made it impossible for us to find genuine love in the church. Today, instead of the church influencing the society, our society is influencing the church. You find things in the church that are out there, but it's difficult to find things out there that are from the church. He cursed a fig tree. Why? Because if there's anything, if there's one thing God dislikes, is hypocrisy. God calls for us to keep it real. In Matthew 6, in Matthew 7, 6 to 20. Is this the, yes. It says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I'm reading from the New International Version. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grip from a thorn bushes or fake from thirst? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you shall recognize them. By their fruit, you shall recognize them. Again, we came to church this morning. God woke you up this morning for a purpose. I don't know why. God brought you here this morning for a purpose. I don't know why. But one thing I know, I had different messages to preach, but the Spirit led me to preach this one. I know that you are not here by an accident. That I know. The the Spirit of God, we pray that He convict us and trouble us for us to be authentic Christian. Amen? Amen. I would like to leave you with a story that I heard and I thought it was pretty interesting. There was an actor. You know how all the celebrities meet, have this big celebration and all meet together. So they were having this big function and in the function, there was this actor who was known for reciting long scenes, long lines. He was very smart. So he asked the audience. In fact, he challenged the audience. Give me anything to recite, and I'm going to recite it. Any line, I will recite it. But nobody stood up. There was an old man in the audience. I don't even know why he was there. He was an old pastor. He was in the audience, and he stood up, barely standing up, shaking. And he stood up and said, I would like for you to recite the 23rd Psalm. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard the story before. He said, I would like for you to recite the 23rd Psalm. And the actor was shocked. He didn't see that coming. 
But uh, he knew the Tonatar psalm. And he recited the Tonatar psalm. It was great. He recited it was so, I mean, it was such an eloquent. It was nice. His diction was beautiful. And when he got through reciting the 23rd Psalm, the audience, there was a spontaneous applause. Everybody cheered for him. It was awesome. And the actor figuring he should get back to the old man. So he told the old man, hey, why can't you recite it too? The old man didn't see that coming because the old man was not planning on that. He asked the old man to recite the 23rd Psalm. So the old man stood up and he recited the 23rd Psalm. His voice cracked, it broke, it was not beautiful. But he recited it because of his love of Christ. And when he got through, there was no cheering, no ovation, nothing. There was complete silence. But there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Amen. Everybody was crying in the room. Yes. Then when the actor caught, when he got his composure, he stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I reach your eyes and your ears. He reached your heart. Amen. This old man reached your heart. And he also said, the difference between me and the old man is that I know the Tonita sound, but he knows the shepherd. Amen. Amen. Fellow believers, to be a Christian means you should know the shepherd. Amen. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about showing off in church or playing church. Christianity is not something that is done out of formality. Christianity, <clears throat> excuse me, Christianity in its modern term is not a religion. It is a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you have that love relationship today? Do you walk with God, not just on Sabbath? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have that confidence that when somebody asks you, if you are a Christian, you can boldly say, yes, you're a Christian. Please, let's not miss. Let's not miss those opportunities in front of us every day to grow in faith and grow in those works of faithfulness. Please, let us miss. Let's not miss. Let's not us miss this opportunity to extend ourselves for the kingdom and the good of other people around us. Amen. Let's not miss an opportunity to go out of our way, out of our way, and extend the good of the kingdom towards someone who is so different from us. I promise you, if we do, as Jesus searches our homes, as he searches his church, as he searches our hearts, he will find fruits and not just leaves. Amen. Amen.